We would like to take another moment to thank our sponsors, whose financial support helps make Cap Times Idea Fest the important event that it is. Special thanks to our presenting sponsor, UBS, the Burrish Group. They have been a major sponsor since the very first Idea Fest. Major sponsors include Health X Ventures, Exact Sciences, and Quartz. Co-sponsors are Madison Gas and Electric, Godfrey and Kahn Law, the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and Epic. Our Friends of IdeaFest sponsors are Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation, Madison Community Foundation, University Research Park, Cargo Coffee, Doc Smokehouse, and Forward Theater Company. Our media partners are the Wisconsin State Journal, Madison.com, WKOW Channel 27, and Hinkley Productions. Again, we thank you for your support and for making IdeaFest 2021 a huge success. Hi, I'm Chelsea Decane Jarabic, Director of Marketing and Social Media at the Cap Times, and I'd like to welcome you to Cap Times IdeaFest 2021. This is the festival's fifth year featuring both live and virtual sessions. Our theme this year is reckoning with change and there's certainly been a lot of that. Staging Idea Fest is always a big lift and we couldn't do it without Cap Times members. If you're not already, I hope you'll consider becoming one. Not only do members help shape events like this one, but they support an independent and trustworthy local media source at a critical time. Find details online at membership.captimes.com. Finally, I'd like to thank our presenting sponsor, the Burrish Group at UBS, as well as our numerous other sponsors. So please enjoy this session. You'll find other festival videos at captimesideafest.com. Hello and welcome to this year's Cap Times Idea Fest. I'm Abigail Becker. I'm the city and county government reporter for the Capital Times. And today we're here to talk about housing in Madison. Welcome everyone. Um, so the city of Madison is one of the fastest growing large cities in Wisconsin. According to the 2020 census during the past decade, the city added 36,631 residents. That's a 16% growth rate for a new population of 269,840 people and that population is only expected to increase. As Madison strives to add housing to keep pace with its growth, how can we break down barriers to housing and address historic racism in the housing market? During this next hour, I hope to discuss with the panelists here today, various programs and creative solutions going on in the city and community organizations to house everyone here. We have an excellent group of people here today, and I'd love for you all to introduce yourselves and what you do here in the city. Um, and as you go around and introduce yourself, if you could share um, perhaps a memorable, for better or worse, uh, housing experience that you've had in Madison, I think that'd be a great place to kick off. Anyone can jump in. My name is Kurt Paulson. I'm a professor of urban planning at UW-Madison, and I teach and research on housing. And my experience was when I moved here in 2006, it was the height of the market. so. Everything was a flip and was really expensive, and we looked at 60 houses and got outbid on a lot of them. So a lot like today, just inadequate supply and lots of people wanting to buy houses. So, Thanks for sharing that. Vanessa, we can go to you next. Sure. My name is Vanessa McDowell. I'm the CEO of YWCA Madison. And an experience I had in housing um, was interesting. Um, at the time, I was looking to move from being a renter to a homeowner, and had a lot of hoops to jump through um, and a huge down payment that I was supposed to make. And so it really uh, showed me just kind of the also systemic racism stuff that also goes within mm -hmm. lending mm -hmm. as well as um, home ownership. And so um, it took a lot for me uh, who was successful uh, in my career as well as um, having some financial means to still get a loan, right? Mm -hmm. So I think uh, there's some discussion obviously there. Definitely. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm Satya Rhodes-Conway. I'm the mayor of Madison. And, um, you know, I think I, I have lived three places in Madison uh, only. And I'm going to take it in a completely different direction. Mm -hmm. um, the, the place that I live now, um, my house on the uh, east side, 
coincidentally, I moved in literally around the corner from my now partner. We didn't know each other at the wow. time. We didn't actually meet in the neighborhood, uh, but learned after we met that we literally lived around the corner from each other. Um, and she didn't actually move in from that place. She moved somewhere else and then moved in with me. But I, I just, it's a very interesting coincidence um, and I think impresses upon me um, you know, the networks that happen in Madison and um, what, you know, we're a big city, but we're also a really small city. Definitely. Um, well, briefly, I'll just share mine, which is um, I lived in this little blue house downtown um, right after I graduated um, college here at UW. And now it's slated uh, to be torn down and to be built into a bigger uh, development. And so even in uh, my, you know, not as many years um, as some here in Madison, um, you know, I can already see places where I live, you know, kind of transforming. And so that's been interesting to watch. So mm -hmm. thank you for sharing that. And so now let's really get into the issue. Um, Mayor Rhodes Conway, when you look at Madison's housing market, what worries, what concerns you most as mayor of this city? Uh, this, the single biggest worry for me is that we are not um, going to be able to build enough housing um, to make sure that everyone has a choice of where they live, uh, which implies that everyone can afford, not just afford one place, to live in Madison, but actually afford to choose what kind of neighborhood they want to live in, where in the city they want to live. Um, and, and we know that that's not true right now, um, dramatically not true right now. Um, and I'm worried that we are not going to be able to build enough options um, all across the city to make that true in the future. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to turn to you, Kurt, next. We talked about sort of the squeeze in Madison's housing market as it relates to the availability of housing units. Um, could you walk us through, you know, what is causing this and then how that affects um, housing affordability? Right. Yeah, so to amplify the, the mayor's comments, uh, in Dane County, jobs are growing faster than population, and population is growing faster than housing units. So the way to think about that is we underproduce about 1,000 units every year that is, we're adding more people and fewer units, right? So that squeeze is felt up and down the price point because you have more people chasing fewer housing units. And that also means that those who have money can choose to live where they want to live, and those who have less money can't. And so you're seeing uh, prices go up, vacancies go down, and landlords get more choosy, right? So if you have children or uh, need a, an accommodation for a disability, there's greater difficulty finding housing. That means that on the ownership side, uh, you need a large down payment just to even afford something pretty modest. Um, and so affordability is actually up and down the, the price point. And so that particularly impacts uh, low and moderate income workers, people of color in the city. And those disparities, uh, we, we see it all around the city. Mm -hmm. I mean, in this um, sort of state of housing that we see in Madison, um, you know, has been a challenge for some time. You know, we, we look at this vacancy rate that's been a challenge. Um, from your research and, you know, studies, you know, has this problem gotten worse, you know, fairly recently? Has it been yeah. an ongoing sort of trend? So it's really gotten worse in the last decade after the Great Recession. You see it in the Madison numbers. You see it in Wisconsin numbers. We used to produce a large volume of housing. Um, and then it just collapsed during the Great Recession, and we're still less than half of what we used to produce. Mm -hmm. So at some level, it, it, I mean, housing is more than just math, but it's a math problem that if you have too many people and you're just not building units, uh, people have to double up or they live really far away, so they drive 45 minutes. And um, yeah, so it's really been in the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. To quantify that a little bit, mm -hmm. you, you mentioned some numbers, but um, I disagree with me if you if you want. But I, I hear that about a five five point five percent vacancy rate is is where you want to be to have sort of a balanced um, market, um, which doesn't preference too much landlords or too much renters, mm -hmm. right? And and so to achieve that, Madison would need to create today about 4,000 units of housing yeah. to keep up every year after we theoretically do that, we would need to be adding somewhere between 1,000 and 2,000 units per year, 
right? And so just like, that's a lot, <laughs> right? Yeah. And to, you know, to put that in perspective, the city's affordable housing spending over the past five years created just a little bit north of a thousand units. I think we're at 1,200 something, right? And now we're doing more every day, right? Every year we're spending more money on affordable housing, but we can't, and that's necessary, right? But we can't do it alone and we can't, the city cannot do enough on its own. We need the private sector to be creating more and more units and a, and a broader range of types of units. Mm -hmm. And Vanessa, I wanted to turn to you. You know, we talked, we we're talking about um, choices and making sure everyone has a choice. And um, when we look at the challenges that we see here today with housing, uh, you know, the most vulnerable are often left with no choice then at all. And yeah. I'd love to learn from you a bit more about, um, you know, what does Madison's housing market look like for the community that the YWCA serves? And what do you think would be needed to um, help that population um, overcome the challenges that they experience? Yeah, I mean, I think with the population that we serve, obviously we're serving uh, the most marginalized folks. We're serving folks who, you know, landlords won't even give a chance. Mm -hmm. uh, we're serving folks that uh, may have had um, something come up maybe in their history that because of that, they're held to that for the rest of their life. Uh, and so it is a huge challenge uh, for the folks that we serve to find housing in Madison. Now, we have had um, some success with the outskirts of Madison, right? But then that runs into the problem of transportation. So if you don't have a car um, and you're relying on the bus system and the bus doesn't go there, what are you doing, right? And say your job is in Madison, right? So it, it just creates one problem after the next, right? And so I think what is hugely um, challenging is there is some support, I'll say, for families. Um, I think our community is more receptive to families. So if you have children, there seems to be more resources there. But let's think about the population of singles that we have in our city, that there is really no support there. You think about single men, you think about single women. We are the largest provider of affordable housing for single women in Dane County and have been for some time. But that's even changing, right? So the funding that we've had to be able to provide services like that has gone away. So how do we create um, more streams or more opportunities for populations like that, right? Folks that are just coming here, say from anywhere, right? And trying to have a better life or want to live here just for whatever purpose. And they come and have really no real opportunity. And so for me, it's really about, you know, not, one, it's a little challenging to see a lot of the high rises that are built and we know they're not affordable um, because there seems to be more priority, right, in the private sector or folks that are, um, you know, builders, they're wanting to make money, right? So that leaves out this population of folks that just don't have the funds to be able to do so um, and choose, right, what we're talking about. I would love to see, I think COVID has really shown us that space uh, is relative in terms of needing it. Um, there's so many people working from home right now. There are some companies that have decided to not even have their folks come back into a physical space. So what happens to those spaces? Could it be a possibility that those spaces are turned into some sort of affordable housing? Could that be an opportunity for um, spaces that Let's take our building, for instance, YWCA on the square. We've been there for years, but it was the Belmont Hotel before that, right? And so it's an old building, very old. And you can only imagine the repairs that go mm -hmm. into a building like that, right? Um, and the small rooms, right, that we just were using what we have, right, to support housing for people. But what if we were able to build something completely new on the square, because I'm going to say in the square, because I do like our location, because our folks are able to get to wherever they need to get to. It's a great place to be. And it forces, I think, people who, uh, I would say, live in a bubble and don't get to experience people who maybe don't have the means. It forces them to have to see that, hey, there are people out here that don't have what you have. Um, and they're right here on our Capitol Square. Mm -hmm. And so I think there is opportunity. I would wonder, how do we make the connection between sort of businesses 
uh, that are no longer using their space to have this conversation about how do we maybe redevelop the space to offer affordable housing. Yeah, I think there yeah, could be a lot of interesting uh, discussions on mm -hmm. that, especially as we um, hopefully exit the pandemic um, mm -hmm. in the hopefully near future here. I wanted to touch on something you had brought up, which is just, you mentioned how high rises being built and who are those being built for? And mm -hmm. we talk about how many, you know, the mayor mentioned how many units Madison needs just to keep up. So I think the question that comes to mind for me is, well, what, what type of units? Market rate, affordable housing units, mm -hmm. all of the above? Yes. Um, what is, mm -hmm. all yes. of the above. I mean, yes. literally yeah. all of the above, yes. right? Because it, it so it, not just market rate, but affordable at literally every level of income, right? From the lowest to the highest. And so affordability is relative to your income. Um, and so we, we do need to be creating units that are affordable at every level of income. We need to be creating studios on up to, you know, three, four yep. larger apartments. We need to be creating new opportunities for home ownership, right? Whether that's condos or, um, you know, uh, row houses or even standalone single family homes. Um, and so, I mean, this is like, there, I really want us to get away from pitting market rate against affordable, right? Or single family against rental, right? Because we need all of them. And we have to be creating all of them in our neighborhoods all across the city in order to get us out of the deep, deep hole that we're in. And you know, I understand that people are resentful about the some of the larger apartment buildings that go up. And no, they're not creating affordable housing. But the creation of those units is keeping other units from getting less affordable. And so, it's you know, the city, I think, doesn't really is not really interested in putting a lot of energy into new market rate housing. We expect the private sector to deliver that. And um, we're more interested in putting our energy into different types of housing, affordable types of housing, co-ops, land trusts, et cetera. But we still need the private sector to be creating all of the above. Well, I, I would interject too that, you know, one of the things that I think is important in this conversation that I think is left out sometimes is that um, once you start focusing on uh, the most marginalized folks or the folks that I would say have the least, everybody benefits from that, right? Absolutely. And I think that and there that, is you know, not, that's let, what me, let me finish. Is. So there's, there's also an opportunity for us to sort of have a different narrative around what are we actually doing? We're talking about creating housing. Who is the housing for, right? So even when you're talking about the numbers and we're talking about we need to produce a thousand more units, but it's like for who? right and who is mixed up in that thousand and then also what is sort of the priority of our our community or our city to really focus on the folks that really are being pushed out so i think as much as you're saying yes we need housing for all types of people absolutely but i think what happens with that is you continue to have the disparity grow and grow and grow and grow until you really create an intentional focus on communities of color and, and folks that are really um, left out of this picture, right? Because we're starting from less than zero because of our history, right? So when you talk about, you know, this is what this panel is about, is sort of the historical stuff that's happened, like black people being left out of the GI Bill, right? Or yep. Uh, the redlining that has happened, or you know, all yep. the things and that the have created, against yeah, multifamily that's housing created and, all of this yep. space of where we are today, um, really, to me, helps us to get to a point where it's like, okay, we got to have some intentional focus here about how do we right some of these wrongs here that have happened, because honestly, we're going to continue to be playing catch up for the rest of our lives unless we continue, you know, figure out a way to be intentional about what happened here. And talking about, you know, that's why I use the story that I shared because I wanted people to hear that it comes from all lanes. It comes from the lending side. It comes from, you know, the housing side. There are so many things and factors that systemically we're dealing with racism um, that creates where we're at. And so that's where I wanted to kind of make sure the conversation also focuses is, is your point Abby about like why we're here today is really to talk about how we got here and how do we get out of here 
right, and get to a better place of not only, because, you know, to be honest, the rich are okay. <laughs> they got housing. They have the things that they need really to, to be able to live here, but we're not having an intentional focus on the folks that, you know, the tale of two cities, the folks that don't have. Well, I, I actually would argue that we are having that focus. Perhaps not enough. Maybe it will never be enough. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I think the city has been laser focused on creating more affordable housing. We've spent millions of dollars every year on the creation of affordable housing, and we continue to. Our home ownership programs are focused on communities of color and will remain so, um, where we're helping people with financial education, down payment assistance, you know, all the tools for, uh, then also rehab to help people stay in their homes. But right? the, the numbers don't lie. Is it getting better or worse? It, well, it, we are barely keeping up, right? I mean, this is the problem is that we've got that, and that's why we have to be building every type of housing. Yeah. Because if we're not building more housing, and I'm just going to be real here, if we're not building more housing for rich people, they are going to push downward into the market and displace people. So we have to be creating everything. I agree oh, I with agree. you yeah. that we have to focus, particularly on communities of color and particularly on low-income folks. And that, I think, is what the city is doing. It's what you see in our work in South Madison. It's what you see in our work with affordable housing, making sure that we are... Um, putting a, a, we call it super preferred, but a, a special preference for creating affordable housing around transit so that people have that connection between housing and transit and employment, right? And that we don't just see, which is what happens in other cities, that luxury housing gets built where the transit is and you don't have any room for affordable housing, right? So we are actually actively asking for creation of affordable housing in transit quarters, right? We're actively thinking about how we create new home ownership opportunities in South Madison. And we're putting money behind it. it. You know, it's a deep hole to dig out of, to your point, right? We're at less than zero, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that you know, it's not like we're, we're spending a lot of money to create luxury housing in the city, right? We're putting our limited resources, I think, where they need to be. Well, and Kurt, you shared a figure earlier just about um, that sort of, I think, illustrated the, the scope of the problem. Right. And could you share that for the, for the group? Um, yeah, so I mean, I think both perspectives are correct. And I think the city of Madison is a real leader nationwide in trying to leverage as many sources of funding as possible to develop and preserve affordable housing. But it, it becomes this math problem that as thousands of people move here every year, if you don't build enough housing to keep up with the people moving here, and by definition, almost new construction is always going to be market rate if it's private sector, or if the city's going to do it, that gap between the cost to construct and the rent that is affordable is a quite significant gap per unit that's got to be made up for with local, state, and federal sources. I think Madison's been tremendously successful in leveraging all those sources but it really does feel like a drop in the bucket compared to the need. So we're gonna add 55,000 housing units in the next 20 years in Dane County. That's, that's a mind-blowing number, right? And if we don't build those units, then people are still gonna come here because we already see that they already are. And they're going to displace and take, you know, take the next available unit and that's gonna drive up prices. So it feels counterintuitive to say that building new market rate housing makes things less bad. Mm -hmm. But that's really where we are, given the huge demand pressures. And then the city is building and preserving existing affordable housing. So of those 55,000 units we have to build in the next 20 years, if we're really, really, really aggressive and get every possible source and turn it up to 11, that might be 10,000 units, new construction that's affordable. The rest are going to be market rate to meet that uh, demand because the private sector won't build, as you know, they won't build affordable housing unless there's some subsidy attached to it. But I think that, that what you said is important because it's, it's the less bad, right? It's not making things better, right? But it is making things less bad in the long term. And that's a totally frustrating place oh, to yeah. be. But, I, you know, I, I guess you could, I don't know that we really want to take the conversation in this direction, but... Uh, you know, part of this is about the restrictions that the state has put on us in terms of protecting tenants, right? Part of this is about 
the nature of the housing market in the United States and the way we finance housing, which you know I think is is to your point, Vanessa, inherently racist, and to a certain extent not within our control in the community in the Madison community, right? Um, and so we're we're trapped in a little bit of a box in terms of what tools we can use, right? We've been preempted from inclusionary zoning, you know. I mean, we there's just a, a whole we can't use tax credits, and you know, I mean, there's just a whole list of things that aren't available to us that are available to other cities. Um, and I'm as eager as everybody, anybody, to find new ways to do things and new tools. I'm excited about the prospect of converting hotels for example, to housing. I'm excited about the prospect of converting office buildings to housing, if we can do that. Um, I have no idea how that pencils out. I have, a, I have a small idea how it might pencil on a hotel. I, don't, I haven't looked at the, the economics of, the, of um, uh, office building, but I, you know, I think we need to be looking at every structure that already exists and see if we can turn it into housing. Right? I think we need to be looking at every lot and seeing if we can create housing on it, um, or if we can add housing on it, right? I mean, just given the scale of the need, we have to be thinking, and we always have to be thinking about it intentionally in terms of who it will be available to, and how do we make sure that it is more available to the folks that need it most? Well, you know, and I think where this conversation, to me, is, is leading to, or having us open our minds to, is that everything that we've stated has been what has been, right? Um, everything that we're talking about is from the structures that are already exist. And those structures historically have been built with right. a white frame, mm -hmm. right? For white people, right? Um, and so when you're talking about the tools or the things that we have and the restraints that you have in the city that you have to um, you know, work around or work within, I guess my point is, I think the issue is that we're looking at it from the wrong lens in, in the sense of we're thinking of what can we do with the structure that we have? My point is, how do we build a new structure, right? That creates a totally different mindset of how do we go about this without using those same tools and the same things that we've been using historically forever that has created what we have today. And so I'm thinking, for instance, I'll give an example, we were talking about um, my personal passion around housing, right? I'm born and raised here in Madison, so I have a connection and a passion to see my city do better when it comes to folks that look like me and us having a place of belonging here in Madison and a stake in home ownership and building wealth here. Mm -hmm. And so what I did was I created an LLC called Madison Roots that is specifically targeted to do something around building black wealth here in Madison for families that look like me, right? Part of that is one, creating opportunities where we can censor, and this has been working, right? So this is a totally out of the box idea is my point, right? So from the George Floyd murder, there's been a lot of people that have been asking, what can we do? What can we do? Because some people's eyes just got opened during that time, right? So I started to think, what can we do? And I started to think about, when you're talking about sort of a form of reparations, right, from the historical things that have happened, I started to have conversations with what I'm calling my white co-conspirators and saying, hey, how do we transfer some of this wealth from my white co-conspirators to the black community? We have really good conversations, right? So I'm talking to neighborhood groups, I'm talking to all kinds of folks. We created a group of folks that contribute money monthly, however often they want to, of white co-conspirators transferring wealth to the black community through Madison Roots. We're buying houses, we're taking those houses. The folks are, we have a bank that we're working with, I won't name, that has also been on this journey of what do we do as a lender differently than we have been doing and seeing. And we're saying, hey, based on our relationship with the bank, them knowing us, us vetting the folks making sure they're able to pay, because we don't want to set anybody up to fail, yeah. making sure that they're able to pay their mortgage. They're renting from us for a year, right? We're paying the down payment through the transferring of wealth of those dollars. We're paying for the 
monthly they're going to be paying what it would be to cost, you know, for that, that particular uh, rent that they would be paying uh, for the mortgage eventually and the insurance and all that's in the rent. And then a year later, they own the home. They don't have to pay the down payment because we already took care of that. They don't have to do it. They already are starting the equity because we gave it to them. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's an outside of the box of mm -hmm. what we have already set up in our structures that have created the systemic thing that we're talking about here, systemic racism, that we got to stop using these same structures to answer the question or the, the problem that we have and think something different. Right. Think of something from a different lens than what we've consistently been thinking about and using the same tools that uh, we consistently use. And, and I think that's just fantastic. And you see, I mean, that's an innovation in Madison. I think you've seen other innovations from the private sector here in Madison. There's a, a group that has put together a private sector fund to support affordable housing in our community, which I think is fantastic and should grow. Um, and I would hope that more businesses would get involved in that. Um, uh, and I think that is a way of, um, you know, trying to, to give back some of what's owed. Um, I, you know, Madison is a, a place where we have a really strong cooperative housing movement. I think that should grow. Um, it's a different way of getting at affordability. Um, I think I would love to see us have a stronger land trust, which is yet another option. Um, I would love to see us think harder about um, what home ownership means. Does it have to be a single family house? Can it be a more affordable condo? Can it be um, a row house? Uh, you know, I mean, the, what options can we create to get people into home ownership um, that starts out more affordable um, and allows them to build that wealth? I just, I think it needs to be, yes, both and all of the above um, in order for us to really be successful in getting where we need to be. Um, I'm really glad that the conversation is trending towards solutions because that's exactly where I <laughs> uh, was hoping it would go. So we will address more solutions in the next half here. Thank you so much. We would like to take another moment to thank our sponsors, whose financial support helps make Cap Times Idea Fest the important event that it is. Special thanks to our presenting sponsor, UBS, the Burrish Group. They have been a major sponsor since the very first Idea Fest. Major sponsors include HealthX Ventures, Exact Sciences, and Quartz. Co-sponsors are Madison Gas and Electric, Godfrey and Kahn Law, the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and Epic. Our Friends of IdeaFest sponsors are Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation, Madison Community Foundation, University Research Park, Cargo Coffee, Doc Smokehouse, and Forward Theater Company. Our media partners are the Wisconsin State Journal, Madison.com, WKOW Channel 27, and Hinkley Productions. Again, we thank you for your support and for making IdeaFest 2021 a huge success. Welcome back to this year's Cap Times Idea Fest. We're going to continue the conversation about housing and how it is a challenge in Madison and potential solutions. So um, we've been talking a lot about um, more creative, out of the box um, sort of ideas um, to address this big challenge. And actually, one um, one idea that I was reading about from another city was in Evanston, Illinois, and this year approved um, a local reparations restorative housing program. And um, you know, this sounded a little bit, um, you know, somewhat what Madison Roots is, is sort of getting at. And um, this program in Illinois, um, it will grant qualifying households up to $25,000 for down payments or home repairs. And um, so that stuck out to me as sort of a really interesting uh, program that a municipality was taking on. So I'd love to hear your thoughts more about if something like that could work in Madison or other ideas similar to that, um, you know, going on, which Madison Roots, I think, is one of those. But if there's others that come to mind, I think it'd be a great place to uh, start this second half off with. Yeah, I mean, I think the uh, example that uh, Vanessa was talking about is really innovative, and uh, you're seeing programs like that crop up around the country. Really, I think based on the research that we've known for 20 years of what works to expand opportunities for people of color to own homes, right? It's it's not rocket science. It's down payment assistance plus home buyer education counseling plus ongoing support 
in a neighborhood where property values are stable or appreciating, and then working with lenders to overcome some of these structural barriers in the mortgage market. So, yeah, and I think Evanston is really interesting because they decided to pay for this out of city funds. Um, and the, the challenge, of course, as the mayor knows, is that those monies have to come out of, that shows a priority, but it's going to come out of your budget subject to your other fiscal constraints and so that means taking money away from other programs. So, but anything I think we can do to fund those programs, uh, a mix of philanthropy dollars, corporate money, work with bankers. Um, there is a statewide, well, let me back up. There's a, also a good model in Milwaukee called Take Root Milwaukee, which is a, a network of realtors, um, banks, community development organizations that really help uh, act housing you may have heard of. They help people, down payment assistance, acquire house, home, home repair. And we're going to launch that statewide, too, to kind of create that uh, ongoing network of, of people working on creative solutions on the home ownership side. So it's a great idea. It's just like every housing tool we have, it, it, it kind of comes down to do we have enough money to do it? And city, state, and federal dollars are clearly inadequate right now. So part of it is advocacy at the federal and state level for more funding. Mm -hmm. and we, we spend right now about two, two and a half million dollars a year on homeownership uh, for the city of Madison. Um, so it's not nothing. Um, and it's exactly what you're saying, right? It's down payment assistance, it's home buyer education, um, and, so, and then some rehab. Uh, for folks to be able to stay in their homes, uh, which is another thing that we haven't talked about much, which I actually am increasingly concerned about, is um, the ability of people on fixed incomes who do own a home to stay in it in the long term. Um, but I, you know, I, the thing that's interesting to me about the Evanston example, because people keep bringing it up, they're funding it from their marijuana tax. So they did not have to make the choice mm -hmm. to go into their budget and carve out the funds and not fund something else. They took a new revenue stream and redirected it into this program, uh, which is, I think, brilliant, good for them, lucky them for having a marijuana tax to be able to tap. Um, you know, if the state of Wisconsin would make some different choices, we could tap into a funding source like that um, and we could direct it in that way. And I think it would very, be very appropriate to use that kind of funding for a reparations program. Well, I think it's interesting too. You know, it's kind of like the, you know, when you hear people say, um, you can tell kind of what someone's priority is based on how they spend their dollars, right? So you look at your own, you know, budget and you look at where am I spending my dollars? That says a lot about who you are and where, you know, where your priorities are. And I think to your point about, you know, taking from one to do fund another. Well, I think part of it is again expressing what is the city's priorities. Now, I understand these are hard decisions to make. However, I think there is something to be said about again, what are we prioritizing, right? So, if you give an example of new dollars, right, or you know the will tax that you just did, right, that was a whole set of dollars. Look, I'm I got to pay my uh, hundred and twenty-two dollar bill right now, yeah. right? That. <laughs> has gone up um, and it's a vehicle registration fee not a wheel tax either way <laughs> there's a set of dollars right that have created has been created to launch and fund transportation right so is that going to help with transportation in some ways right yep so there's clearly a priority around transportation that was made a, we, the mayor made a decision that was a priority why couldn't that priority have been on this side of things, right? But, so that's to, that's to where that. Let me finish. Asset. Let me finish. Let me finish. We have so here, let me finish. Can housing. I finish? Can I finish my comment? Please. So here's where I think we have to have a, a deeper conversation, and this is why I'm here. In this, you know, you invited me, so here I am, right? To challenge some of the things that we mm -hmm. have been saying that we're doing, and all of the things that the city sometimes will say. Well, we're doing this. We have you know, however many dollars towards home ownership. Where is that? Who knows that? Right. Where is that connected to a program uh, of folks that are doing this work that look like the people that we're trying to serve? Right. It, it, it bothers me in a lot of ways that we have a lot of no knock to anybody. Right. But we have a lot of folks that are making decisions for people that look like me. That don't look like me. 
But here I am telling you of a program, telling you of an innovation that I have created for people that look like me, but there's been no connection between, hey, Vanessa, these $2 million I have or whatever the amount of money I have for home ownership, boom, can I send it through Madison Roots so that, because I trust what you're doing and that you understand what you need to do for the folks that you're talking about, right? So I think there is, I'm gonna challenge you, that's all I'm saying is I'm challenging on what you're saying your priorities are because well, there is a sense of you are saying what your priorities are, where your money is. And I'm gonna challenge you right back mm -hmm. because we have increased funding for affordable housing in every single budget that I have put forward, dramatically. Where's, where, where is it? Where are we seeing the, the change? It, we have upped the amount of money that's going to tax credit projects. We have upped, we have created an entirely new funding stream, which by the way, I'm surprised you haven't applied for for Madison Roots. Have you told me? Have you called? I have. No, told yeah. you oh, now you should lie, don't lie. The, I have okay, told you this. <laughs> that this money exists and you no, know about no, it, Vanessa. It is money that's available for out of the box solutions Never heard of. For affordable housing. And we are actually funding the Urban League to yes. do uh, uh, home ownership programs in part out of that money. Okay. Right? So this money's been available. We've had one RFP for it. We're coming up on the other, on the, uh, in fact, it may already be on the street. There's, uh, it's an RFP that is for non tax credit housing solutions. And so we funded the land trust, we funded housing cooperatives, we funded home ownership programs, we've funded, funded rehab programs. Right? This is an entirely new stream of funding that has come from my administration. Which was a change in policy in terms of how some of that city funding is, yeah. is given out. Yeah, it's a, it's a it's a new change in how we use our affordable housing dollars. Because prior to that, it was always with um, federal tax credits yes. and trying to leverage. Um, yeah, which is still good, those. and we still need to do that. And we've increased the money for tax credit projects every year. Um, but at some point, we've maxed out what we can do on tax credits. And yep. tax credit projects don't serve everybody, right? So we need to have these new innovative solutions and that's why I created a dedicated funding stream to invite innovation in the housing market and to invite people to come up with new ideas and how we can create affordable housing in more interesting ways that work for everybody. I wish I would have been invited. Well, we, we, we put out the RFPs. That's we let my everybody point. know no. that they're out who, there. Who, who did you let know? Because obviously I didn't know. So my point is to you, Mayor, you're saying these things well, about a, what you're doing, a, right? A, about a dozen community-based organizations knew about it enough. You to, told me that you just said to, there was one RFP, right? There's that, that one there's RFP, one? and okay. we got dozens of applications for the funding, so okay. clearly people knew about it. Okay, that's a bad way to say that, right? Because mm. that's the problem. You want us to come to you instead of you creating and saying to us, as you know, I've, I've had so many meetings with you about my passion around housing, not once have you called me to say, hey, I have these new dollars that can help but, your program. You know, so, that's not, I'm sorry, but I, I don't make personal phone calls to invite people to, to apply for every city program that exists. We have a lot of city programs. That's okay. I don't have enough time in the day to call people personally, invite people to apply to all My of them. My point is that you have a team of folks. It doesn't have to be you, Mayor, that you again, are not getting out into the communities that were, are impacted by this to make it broadly no. known. It's just like, you know, I think we we're gonna have that, to respectfully I, agree to disagree on this one. That's fine, but can you let me finish? Like you keep cutting me off. I, I'll let you say your piece and I'll say mine. Um, is that just like we have in expectation of when we're trying to diversify an organization, right? So you're hiring and you're saying, okay, I can't get any people of color in my organization. I put it out there but they're not applying. So there must not be any people of color in this community that want to do this job. That's where we're failing as a community because what we're not doing, it's an easy out instead of actually putting some intention behind getting people and getting in communities of color and saying, what's going on? Where can I hear of these programs? What is going on so I can connect and make the connection to the dollars, to the people? That's all I'm saying is that don't, hop out in the sense of saying, I put it out there. Because the sense of it is, 
it's not getting, what I'm telling you is it didn't get to me, so that means it's not getting out there like it should. So what is, can you take back to say, how can we better connect folks that are doing this work to these dollars that I created? I applaud you for creating this stream, but it's not gonna do any good if it's not getting to the people, is all I'm saying. Well, so I, how do we get I these hear you, dollars to the people? But I think that, that you're making some assumptions uh, that are incorrect because I think these dollars are getting to people and I think sure. they are in fact getting into communities of color, not exclusively, but yes. Uh, and uh, you know, the fact that you personally didn't know about it, I'm sorry, but again, many people did know about it and I do think that we are intentionally getting out and working with community-based organizations on the issue of affordable housing in a lot of ways. And as I listen to the mm -hmm. both of you talk, I'm also <laughs> reflecting on uh, my own work as a local journalist here and thinking there are many things going on like Madison Roots, like these RFPs, and what role um, can the local media play in uplifting all of that? Um, I feel like there are many, many stories that I have to write coming out of this panel here. I wanted to, with um, some of the time we have left, also move to um, solutions that are rooted in, um, in the zoning code. You know, we talked about how um, uh, in, the, in the first half about um, historic racism and discrimination in the housing market and how some mm -hmm. of that was wrapped up in zoning rules, right? Like, how, where can people live? Those were <laughs> yep. written down in that code there. And so, um, you know, recently, I think the city council has made um, several changes related to um, to that zoning code in effort to make it easier to develop uh, multifamily housing and transform commercial corridors to a mix of uses. And I'm sure the mayor can correct me if I <laughs> explain that, that wrong there. But um, I think it might be helpful for viewers to understand sort of um, that work and some of those changes in the, um, the le legislative uh, kind of zoning framework there. Um, so whoever would like to jump in, sort yeah. of talk about some of those recent changes and their, um, you know, their intended aim and um, why yeah. they're so important. Yeah, I mean, zoning, I think, is really important in this conversation. Um, land use is really important um, because it is because of the historical truths around redlining and then once redlining was done away with, and I put that in very heavy air quotes, right? Um, the next piece was through the zoning code to make it impossible to build multifamily housing. Um, and it, what we, said, what we had saw in our zoning code was that there were still far too many places where we were scrutinizing multifamily housing way more than we were scrutinizing single family housing. Um, and so we tried to adjust that, make it a little bit better, make it a little bit easier to build multifamily housing. Um, I think we took a good step. Frankly, I don't think it was enough. Um, but it's headed in the right direction. Um, and we're working on more, right? We're working on how do we make it easier to build accessory dwelling units, whether that's um, you know, within a building. So people call them granny flats, but you know, um, just it's opening up another potentially affordable, not always necessarily, but potentially affordable option. Um, giving people choices. Also, backyard cottages, same thing, an accessionary dwelling. So we're working on making it easier to do that through the zoning code. Um, and you know, we're looking at how do we allow for more density in our neighborhoods. And it, one thing that's uh, um, that's really interesting, and and I would really encourage people to go look at the maps coming out of the census, because what you see um, is that. All of the growth in population happened downtown and at the edges of the city. And we have this donut around downtown where we are not seeing growth in housing units. Um, and that's because of zoning and it's because of our existing neighborhood plans. And we have got to find a way to spread the growth out across the entire city and to get into those neighborhoods. I have a friend who, who describes them as being sort of dipped in amber, like they can never change, right? And I think that one of our goals uh, in what we do next in the zoning code is to make it easier to see in a very context sensitive and appropriate way to see the increase of density in those neighborhoods. And that might be through backyard cottages, it might th be through 
um, townhomes. It might be through um, splitting lots to have two single family homes. It, I mean, it might be through small multifamily. I mean, there's a whole range of options there that I think you could easily move into some of our single family neighborhoods without disrupting them. And then, yes, we are going to have to build, build bigger buildings, particularly along transit corridors. Um, but that's where I want to go with mm -hmm. the zoning code and to make it easier for us to see what we need, right, the, to build the housing that we need. And Kurt, you're nodding your head vigorously. What would you like to, <laughs> no, to just, add? I mean, when you look at the origins of zoning in the American system in the 1920s and the 1930s, the idea of a neighborhood being only single family was clearly rooted in racism and exclusion. And so what the, what the mayor's describing is what a lot of cities are doing is trying to open up those established neighborhoods for a greater variety of housing, the type of older urban housing we used to build. Um, and so it's not necessarily affordable or inclusionary, but it's less exclusionary. And uh, I think the other area of reform to look at that a lot of cities are doing is uh, we have a lot of empty space in parking lots, and those could be uh, developed as housing. So just eliminating minim minimum parking requirements in the zoning ordinance so that if someone wants to build a, a less expensive unit that doesn't have any parking so people can walk or take the bus, uh, they can do that. But I think, I think the mayor's absolutely right that once you get out of downtown, right, most of those neighborhoods were developed in the 40s, 50s, 60s, even to the 80s and 90s when it was only single family. And that, that just drives up the cost. Uh, it forces people to drive everywhere. And so, again, to go back to this, if we have to build 55,000 housing units in Dane County, if we can't build some of those in established neighborhoods, we are saying to people who come, you can only live on the outskirts, and that means gobbling up farmland and everybody has to drive. And that will make affordability and uh, racial disparities even worse. So just doing it won't solve the racial disparity and inclusion, but not doing it will make it worse, if that makes any sense. And as we were talking about, um, we've clearly established the need for just more housing overall in Madison, um, and we need that like yesterday. Um, you know, how do you, uh, what are strategies to, to add housing units that, um, you know, don't lead to um, uh, you know, gentrification and pushing people out of their own neighborhoods and displacement? Um, you know, we. Uh, Madison is between two lakes, right? So there's not a whole lot of areas, you know, in the center of the city to, to go outward, right? And so um, how do you add housing, but then also make sure that the people who are already living here and in their neighborhoods can, can stay and that their housing can remain affordable? This, I think, is, is the stickiest problem. Yeah. Um, and it's something that I think about a lot and that I've, I'm frustrated that I feel like we around the I think that you know some of the things that we've already talked about are, are part of the solution certainly creating more options in every neighborhood is part of the solution and um, what I would love to be able to do is as you create those units to allow for a right of return or to allow for to open them up first to people who live in that neighborhood um, and that would be a way to, to sort of dig out of some of the hole of displacement that we've already experienced and allow people to move back into where they grew up or, you know, the neighborhood that they had to move from when they didn't want to. Uh, but we run smack dab into um, federal anti-discrimination laws, and which is unfortunate because what we're trying to do is actually reverse, um, you know, the impacts of racism. But... Um, so we're, for, for projects that the city funds or does, we're not able to be that explicit about it. Um, and I, I think the private sector may have a little bit more leeway than we do, but um, this is, it's a very difficult thing to navigate. I, th I think that would be what would be right, right, is to, have, to let people who live in the neighborhood or who were forced to move from the neighborhood by economic circumstances to have the... the right of return to new units in that neighborhood. That would be the ideal situation, but I think we can't. I would also okay. mention too that I think it's important to recognize that gentrification has already happened in our city. Um, there's the South Madison doesn't look like the South Madison I grew up in um, in terms of 
um, even now, right? So when we're talking, we got to be careful about who we're talking about returning or who's there because it's not really representative representative of what used to be there, if that makes sense. So if you think about even using it, let's use South Madison, for instance. That was a lot of culture there, right? A lot of black culture, a lot of black families own homes over there. Um, there's a, you know, the Boys and Girls Club was the center before it was the Boys and Girls Club. You got Penn Park, all a lot of sort of cultural black things happened in South Madison that were um, helpful and beneficial to growing up, right, as a kid, right, in, in South Madison that are no longer a part of the story today, right? And so I guess part of the question becomes, who are we trying to return, right? And what does that look like now? Because it has changed. The, the landscape of South Madison, unfortunately, has changed in a lot of ways. And so what are we doing to figure out what was the legacy there then, back then that we can bring back versus talking about the population or people who are there right now, right? Because I think that looks very different. Um, and so I think part of it too is making sure that we are um, supporting, you know, the idea around gentrification oftentimes, a lot of times it's like you get new stuff for the well-off, right? And the community that was there before had to deal with all the bad stuff, right? So I wanna figure out a way, how do you put the older community, the community that was there, that was, is being displaced, how do they not get displaced, but also get new stuff, right? How do you get an uplift of a community that looks better and you know you think about the neighborhood grocery store or whatever we have so many food deserts now it's like how do we uplift the community and its face but also bring the people back that uh, were displaced back in the day so i think there is a fine line that happens with gentrification that oftentimes there's a facelift but then the people are displaced there's never sort of this an uplift and the community is still there right that that's where I'm trying to figure out how do we do both and. Yeah, I think that's the, the big key question. Yeah. How do you invest in a right. place that's historically not been invested in and right. make it better? Without for... causing the displacement. Right. And yeah. the exactly. way cities across the country have done that is as you're looking in a neighborhood for new development, you also put dollars into preservation of existing housing. And if you do it like with a TIF finance or something like that, some of the new growth of the new development can pay for some of the preservation. I know that the city's looking at that when they think about incorporating the town of Madison and there's uh, older neighborhoods that have less expensive housing but need some investment and to avoid that displacement you need to kind of pre-spend the dollars either on preservation of existing housing um, or some right to return. I know the city when they're talking about land banking they're, they're looking at that issue of, of right to return yeah. but I, I do, I do yeah. want to say something controversial uh, which I think is based in the research which is you know, and, and I think the conversation in Madison is oftentimes challenged by this question that we think that new development is the cause of gentrification rather than the result of gentrification. And oftentimes if we don't build new stuff to accommodate demand in a neighborhood, then the people who are there will be priced out either way as new people want to come into a neighborhood. If they can't find new housing, they'll take the existing housing. If I can pay $50 more a month, the landlord is going to rent to me rather than to someone who's already living there. So not building enough housing is the main cause of gentrification. It's not new construction does not cause gentrification. That's, where, that's how I read the research. Mm -hmm. I realize that's controversial, but so that in some ways connects the, the two discussions of if we don't build new housing for new people who want to move to certain neighborhoods, then existing residents will get displaced. And I think that, that that's what we have seen, to Vanessa's point. That, that displacement is absolutely happening and has happened for years in Madison. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you, know, when you look at um, uh, the reports that the city and the mapping that the city has done around this, um, we actually had to create a whole typology of neighborhoods that are, like, have already experienced that displacement neighborhoods where it's it's actively ongoing and neighborhoods where we feel like there's a high risk of it so I mean, there's a few more categories in there but but it 
we, we are trying to recognize that this is an ongoing pattern, right? And that, that we're just now coming to the snapshot in time uh, where we're looking at it and trying to do something about it. Um, but we've already missed the boat on a bunch of neighborhoods. Um, and so there is this question of both how do you try and intervene in places where you sort of are actively seeing the potential for displacement and then how do you go back into neighborhoods that already saw it and do something about that. And I, you know, all of this is difficult, but, um, but that I think really is the context for the conversation and to make sure that, again, that we're using the limited set of tools that we have um, to try and create those housing options that give people choices, even if we can't specifically target um, to individuals, can we at least create the opportunity for more choice? Can we at least create um, the, the range of um, price points? Um, can we at least work on, to your point, some of the, um, the preservation of existing folks in, in where they are living now, whether that's, or existing affordable housing? And, you know, all of it's imperfect, but, um, but we are trying to use land banking. We are trying to use our affordable housing funds. Uh, we are trying to use our rehab funds um, to focus on keeping options open. So with our short time left, I just wanted to ask one final question, um, which is just that this is a, this is a big a big issue, <laughs> and at times it can uh, feel a little bit disheartening. Um, you know, what looking forward, um, what what gives you what do you see now that's giving you hope um, about this uh, housing uh, challenge in Madison, and um, potentially also you know in let's say you know five years, you know what do you hope uh, Madison will have um, improved upon? I can start. I, one source of hope right now is um, all of the federal resources that are flowing because of COVID and stimulus give you some opportunities now that you didn't have financially in the past. So, and I know that that's, those dollars are, they come with strings attached and they're not always the easiest to use. Um, but you see in Washington this at least in the most recent stimulus bill, right? An additional increase in vouchers, affordable housing production. So there's at the national level, some additional resources coming. Yeah, I would say also, I think what is hopeful is to see um, other cities sort of taking some initiative to do something different and out of the box, right? And, and to think about housing differently than we have historically been thinking about it. Um, I think it gives me hope to have um, partners like the bank I was referring to earlier who is willing to look at lending differently and look at um, and having their own awakening moment of we've been doing this probably wrong for a long time. How do we do something different? Um, so that those kinds of conversations give me hope around um, changing the narrative around housing for, specifically for marginalized uh, communities and specifically the black community here in Madison and you know what I hope to see in five years is actual change or something done totally different where we're seeing more um, home ownership we're seeing uh, folks that probably other folks have given up on and are not giving a chance given an opportunity I just had a situation recently where I was talking to someone I'm also um, a landlord or and so also creating and knowing that not everybody is yet ready for home ownership, but what can we do to prepare them, right? Let's start with renting, mm -hmm. right? And young man who's not been given a chance, been denied left and right, left and right, left and right. But all he needs is that one opportunity, tears in his eyes, because I'm given an opportunity to change his whole world just by giving him a place to live and call his own. That's the kind of stuff that gives me hope is that we gotta get out of ourselves and get out of what we think and the prejudgments and all this stuff about people and really give people opportunities to do something different. It, you, this is gonna sound odd, but um, the thing that gives me hope right now is that people are waking up to the housing crisis that Madison is experiencing. Because I think that for years, probably at least a decade, Madison as a community did not take housing seriously. 
It wasn't part of our community conversation at the level that it is now. And in order for us to take the problem seriously and start to work on it, it has to be. So I'm hopeful that we're having the conversation, right, and that we understand that we are experiencing a housing crisis um, and that we need to be trying um, many, many, many different things um, that, yes, uh, the city, the county, the state have a role to play, the federal government has a role to play, but actors in the private sector, in the nonprofit sector have an equally important role to play. Um, and so I'm hopeful that those conversations are happening and that um, you know, people like Vanessa are coming up with interesting ideas that we have uh, you know, small numbers, but five graduates from the ACRE program um, who are, live in and will work in Madison and um, that we are upping our spending on affordable housing every, I mean, these things give me hope. In five years, I would love to be able to say that we have created those 4,000 units plus the one to two for every year. I don't know that that's possible, but that's where I'd like to be, is that we've dug ourselves out of the hole that we are creating the units that we need to create to give people the opportunities and choices that they deserve to live in Madison. Thank you all for sharing that and for your time um, from myself and the CAP Times as a whole. We really appreciate you all being here and sharing your expertise. And thank you all for tuning in. Hope you enjoy the rest of CAP Times Idea Fest. We would like to take another moment to thank our sponsors, whose financial support helps make Cap Times Idea Fest the important event that it is. Special thanks to our presenting sponsor, UBS, the Burrish Group. They have been a major sponsor since the very first Idea Fest. Major sponsors include Health X Ventures, Exact Sciences, and Quartz. Co-sponsors are Madison Gas and Electric, Godfrey and Kahn Law, the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and EPIC. Our Friends of IdeaFest sponsors are Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation, Madison Community Foundation, University Research Park, Cargo Coffee, Doc Smokehouse, and Forward Theater Company. Our media partners are the Wisconsin State Journal, Madison.com, WKOW Channel 27, and Hinkley Productions. Again, we thank you for your support and for making IdeaFest 2021 a huge success. <laughs>